inspired us in many ways and we love connecting with staff and campers and just being able to do that throughout the year. I'll introduce my family quickly. We have four kids. Three of them are here. Our oldest, Hazel, was not able to be here this morning. We have Luna, Quinn, and Sophie that are joining us. They are 15, 13, and 10 right now. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, just thinking of coming up here and sharing throughout the year, um, it's a good time to reflect. It's not always my favorite thing when it's time to write our newsletter or time to write a report. And I'm often like, I don't know what to say. It's just camp. We did camp. And then once I start writing and thinking about everything, I'm like, oh, and then I could say this and then this and this. So I will try to keep it short. But as even in the morning as we're driving here, I'm like, oh, I could say this and this. And our gear just keeps changing from season to season. And there's so much that we can share with you guys. I will start with who we are. I know you guys are familiar with us, but those that aren't, um, we are a teens specialty camp and we were built on that premise of trying to reach out to teens specifically. And that is why we also do specialty camps. And that hasn't changed with different directors and different seasons, that has always stayed the same. So we do specific camps, horse camp, paintball camp, bike camp. We do run a general teen camp and we do run a junior camp as well, but our focus would be a teen specialty camp. And also to have small intimate groups um, is really our focus. So I would say there's kind of two things that make us unique um, at what we do at Pemina Valley Bible Camp. One is our size. We max out at 54 campers per week. Um, so it's small groups, small sizes, we do devos together, meals together, one-on-ones as a cabin, and just lots of time just hanging out with you and your cabin leaders and your skill leaders. And so we really get a chance to develop relationships with our campers that way. The second unique thing is, thing is definitely our location. So if you haven't been up to the camp or up to the valley or down to the valley, you should come. It is gorgeous. And with that, we try to get outside and be outside as much as possible. So our chapels are outside, um, our, our devos are outside, our events, any, as much as we can. We don't even have, a other than our dining hall, that's kind of our only indoor building. So we really try to utilize God's creation. The, even the chalets and the cabins were built to have a deck that overlooks the valley. And then you can see the stars every night. And how many kids have commented on just being able to see the stars at night has really affected even their relationship with God just through simple things like that. One thing this past year that God has really been teaching Terry and I or putting in front of us is just opportunities of where he is leading us. And we can plan as directors and say this is the direction we want to go and this is who we think we want to hire and this is what we want to do. And over and over again, God is like, nope, you're doing this. Nope, you're doing this. And we're kind of like at times literally feeling like we're running to catch up. And we're like, oh, okay, I guess we're going this way. And this is what we're going to do. Um, one thing that's happened just this since January is we've hired a head wrangler, which was not necessarily in our plans. But she approached us, and she's been part of our camp and wanted to come back and work with us full time. Um, so that has... That has allowed us to expand our horse program, which is one thing that we have been wanting to do. So this year we're running a kind of more advanced three-day outback horse camp. We're expanding our programs just to allow more campers, to allow more levels, variety of campers that want to be a part of that. Um, <clears throat> we're also adding an advanced wilderness camp. So we did have a wilderness camp. Now we're doing an advanced camp, which is a five-day canoe trip out in the white shell. And God's provided a person who said, yeah, I'll lead that. I know how to do that. I'm going to lead that. And so that's just been fantastic to be able to grow into some of those areas. This fall, um, we added a, what we're calling a Valley Intern Program. And so we wanted to give some of our seasonal staff something a bit more um, than just coming to work at camp for the year. So we really wanted to dive into kind of leadership and skill development with them. And so we have three students that have come back and are staying with us throughout the year. And there's kind of different components of our program. So we do need extra staff throughout the year just to help with rentals um, and different events that we're running. But we also want it to build into them. So they're all in some sort of a Bible school, either Steinbeck Bible College or um, youth Coalition working towards their youth degree. So they are doing biblical classes online um, at camp. They're able to do that. 
They, um, we give them leadership opportunities if there's youth groups or local ministries um, that we can go into and design things for. They're also helping out at camp, and then we're also doing hands-on training with Wilderland Adventure Company, and so we're doing overnight um, field leader certification, paddle certification, just to get our skills up so that we're more confident in our skills as staff <clears throat> and then can give our campers just a better experience and a better program. This program's also helped us be able to get into different or keep relationships that we have with local ministries. And I think it's really neat that Tim and Melissa were featured today. I don't know if that was on purpose, but um, Tim is on our camp board and Melissa we work very closely with at YFC. And so some of our staff or our interns will go volunteer with YFC during the year and so they can keep connected with some of those campers that come to our camp and then we get them for summer or for a few weeks and then we send them back to YFC knowing that they've made that connection with our staff and then our staff will go volunteer there. So with our intern program, a big part of it is that they're connected into a local ministry. So either a youth group, um, two of them are working at the YFC drop-in in Morden and that's just been really neat to keep those connections with the kids. Melissa, I've talked to this summer, they send us kids and I'll meet with her and be like, okay, who are you sending us? What do we need to know? And we had one girl in particular that um, she had kind of warned us about. Her foster mom had called the camp and warned us that she was coming. And another staff member was like, okay, we're getting this girl, we need to be ready for her. So we're like, let's do it, let's, let's go. And she came to camp this one week very clearly. She wanted to come to camp, but she did not want to hear anything about God. And she knew it was a Bible camp, but she was very clear on, I'm not going to open the Bible. I'm not going to listen to the speaker. And we're like, that's fine. You can sit there. Um, just don't be disruptive or rude. And she was, she was a tough girl, and she just kind of sat on the outside. And we... Um, we prayed for her all week, and she was disruptive and, and interesting, but throughout the week, we could see kind of midweek, her cabin leader in the morning meeting was like, she opened the Bible. And we're like, that's amazing. And then by the end of the week, she read the Bible. And we're like, that's amazing. And, and it was just so cool to see her progress through the end of the week. And um, that was kind of the beginning of summer. And midsummer, her foster mom calls and says, do you have room at this, this we have a creative arts camp the last week of summer. And we're like, yeah, we have room. And she's like, well, she wants to come back. And we're like, oh, okay, all right, awesome. So she came back, and we just saw a completely different girl that came in. <laughs> I never cry in this story. It gets me every time. And um, she was just so soft and just so receptive to hearing the word of God. And um, by the end of the week, she had given her life to Christ and she went back that weekend. There was a YFC thing going on at Harvest Fest, and she wanted to tell all of her friends that she had become a Christian. And because of who she had been, her friends wouldn't believe her. They're like, no, you didn't. She's like, no, guys, I gave my life to Christ. And they're like, no, you didn't. Like, and she was like, yeah, God has changed my life. And so we do connect with her. We do see her time to time. And she is still struggling. She has a very difficult background and past to deal with, but it's just been really cool just to have that connection in those ways with the local ministries with these kids. This year, I'm just going to kind of jump ahead, just what do we do through the year? A lot of people ask after summer. Um, we had someone just the other day say, so when do you guys start planning for, for summer? And Terry and I laughed. We're like, oh, about a month ago we started. Oh, okay. So, yeah, January is kind of our summer's almost here. We got we to gotta get moving. And so we have dates set. We have brochures out. And weekends, like during the week it's slow, but weekends, January, February, we have a ton of rentals. We have youth groups, church groups that come up every, almost every weekend, and we host them as, as part of our ministry to them. And then a lot of our prepping for summer has already happened. Um, April, we have, oh, one more thing to mention. Yeah, we have rentals, and then um, this week coming up on Valentine's Day, we have a Valentine's banquet that we started last year. Um, it's really fun. It's just a way to get people to come up to camp and just enjoy an, e enjoy an evening. It is sold out already, so we're looking forward to having another good evening um, this week coming up. 
And then April, we do our fundraising banquets in Winkler and Morden. That's just a time for us to connect with people in town and to share again what we're doing at camp and what's happening there. So currently, um, we would be in the process of looking for staff. That's kind of what we're busy with right now. So cooks, speakers, nurses, summer staff. We do have a spring team that joins us in May and June. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, applications are open now for that. Our camper applications will be open March 18th. So if you want information, it's all on our website now. We have our dates, we have our camps, we have our brochure on there, but registration will open March 18th. So it gives you some time to still plan your summer. So that's just a quick recap of who we are, what we do. There's so many pieces that go into running camp um, that are just, um, yeah, are such a blessing to us. And so we just appreciate you guys and what you do and how you support us with your prayers and your finances and staff and people and just your encouragement to us. And so thank you for being a part of what we get to do at camp and being a part of God's ministry there. Oh, there it is. That's loud. I'll back that off. Awesome. Uh, yeah, my, as Jill said, my name is Terry Friesen. Uh, it's really, really great to be here. And if we rewind a year, uh, we were here last, like a year ago, fall, I think, when everything was so brand new. Um, I had just stepped into the executive director position, and um, James Shields had just come on as our assistant director. Everything was just figuring out constantly. And so one year later, I'm a, a veteran director, and I come to you with all the experience of, of one full year of, of Pemina Valley, um, in which I don't think I've done the same thing twice. Uh, so it is, it's just a constant um, changing um, craziness that is actually awesome. Um, I love the fact that we get to move and, and mold and be in, in different spots to meet people where they're at. Um, so many of the, th the things, like Jill said, opportunities that came our way were not plans of ours whatsoever. Um, but we saw God moving in specific areas, and we said, let's do it. Let's step into those things. And um, where we are today compared to last year, um, I wouldn't have planned that. Um, but it's fantastic, and it's awesome, and, and we're super excited about it. I also do, I just want to double down on what Jill said, uh, how encouraging it is actually to see Tim and Melissa on there, and um, for a partially different reason. Knowing that, even the story that Jill told about a camper, I love the knowing the fact that when you guys pray for campers, when Tim and Melissa talk about them in, at their drop-in center, and then we get to see them at camp, there's three different groups of people that are actually praying for the same camper. And we get to, we get to tie together here as a, as a body of Christ to be able to support these kids to, to pray for them. And even when you pray for them anonymously, because you maybe don't know who they are, they get covered over and over in prayer. And our, our supporters um, often ask, we send bulletins to... Oh man, I don't know how many churches, I think 20 to 25 different churches. And the thought that that same camper gets prayer, you know, 25 times over from different church bodies is just, yeah, it's so encouraging to be able to see and, and great to see them up on the screen as well. Um, and a, as an encouragement, yeah, I'd love to dive into the Word of God a little bit uh, on a Sunday as well, um, just to be able to, to tie in what we do and why we do it. And so um, as a, a scripture passage, uh, for today. I chose John 15, um, 1 to 8, and maybe I'll start off with by, by reading through that, and then I'll explain where, where we're headed today. John 15, 1 to 8 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, 
thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Um, I think it was my dad who said, if you're ever worried about what to, what to speak on, just use Jesus' words. You can't go wrong with that. So I, I love talking about some of his parables, um, partially because there's, some of them are so deep. I was a high school teacher for a long time, and uh, we were having a conversation the other day about Jesus and his teaching. And, you know, some people, if you talk about the history books, etc., even if even an atheist has trouble disproving that Jesus existed. And if anything, he was uh, a prophet or he was a good teacher. And I interjected saying, like, he's not just a good teacher. He is, like, the best teacher the world has ever known. The depth to which some of these stories and parables, the, the layers of meaning, the poignant pieces, without ever saying too much or being really wordy, just strike people, uh, you know, at their hearts. And so I love how much you can say in such uh, a short amount of time. And I love the fact that you can keep coming back over and over um, to things like this. I don't remember the first time I heard this parable, but then, but when I started to uh, read into it and study again of, of thinking, I think this is something that, that I would like to speak about. It fits well with, you know, some of the messages I'd like to bring from camp. I end up learning more about it again. And uh, again, through God's faithfulness, he continues to work in our lives and this is never done with us. And so it's awesome as well to be able to go back to some of those lessons and even learn more about it. Um, some things in his uh, parables, sometimes there's, there's deep imagery and it's tough to understand. Uh, but in this case, there's a few things that are just directly told to us. First of all, it's the characters. Uh, I am the vine. So Christ is the vine. You are the branches. So we, we get to be the branches. And it also says in verse 1 that my father is the gardener. So we have three characters. We have the vine, the branches, and the gardener. And there's, a, there's an intricate relationship between um, those three pieces. I read one document or uh, commentary on the fact that uh, the, the chosen analogy of vine and branches was a really poignant one for, for the time period and for the people because everybody would know very well what it would take to care for um, per perhaps a grapevine, etc. And that the analogy was, was really, really easy to understand and the role was really easy to understand. And because of that, it allowed uh, Jesus to, to produce a teaching that was super easy to understand, um, direct to the, the people, but then really, depth, really deep in meaning. Um, also, just a little bit of, about the, for context, I, I guess, we should note that this is actually not very long before Jesus' crucifixion. These are actually some of the last words that Jesus spoke. And so, um, I know sometimes, and maybe it's over dra drama dramatized, dramatized, um, in terms of people's, you know, deathbed and the last words that they say and how impactful those are. Um, but there is definitely a bit of a theme as Jesus goes through some of the, the messages to his own disciples. He uses a few different I am anal analogies, so I am the good shepherd, um, and things like that. I am the way, the truth, the life. Um, there is a, a few different uses of that. And in this case, the I am is extremely strong. The I am, the true vine, um, isn't just a, a picture of character, isn't just a picture of, of, of who he is so that we know a little bit more about him. He actually also spells out what our relationship is, who we are, and who we aren't. And in this, in this um, analogy, there's some really, really strong words like, you know, without me, you can do nothing but ask whatever you wish in my name. And so there's, there's this really kind of strong statement about who Jesus is, and perhaps it's because it is so close to his crucifixion. He wanted to impart on his disciples, um, yeah, as he leaves, what, what the, the big message he wants to leave them with. And so um, I did take a little look into some of the pieces that are, are within the, the passage, and the one I came across uh, reminded me of my time in Bible college. I had a professor in Bible college who, who had a few different kind of specific, I don't know, catchphrases, et cetera. One of them, and perhaps you've heard something similar, he said, whenever you read the word therefore in the Bible, 
you have to ask what the therefore is there for. Because he said, that's not, it's not a coincidence. It's not by accident. They're not just trying to fill space. The therefore is always written that way because of what was written previous. And so it's connecting to the previous pieces what you're about to learn. The other thing that he said was, whenever you have a passage that repeats a word over and over, pay special attention to what message it's trying to tell you. Because again, it's not as though they didn't have a thesaurus back then. They, just weren't, they weren't short on words. They're telling you something about the emphasis of that passage. And so depending on your translation, um, uh, it gets a little, it, it gets it's hammered home in these eight verses. Whether it is remain in me or abide in me, it's stated seven times in eight verses. And so when I read through it again, I said, what is it about that word? What is it about that concept that God wants to teach us through this analogy? So I'll be using the word abide, I think even though I said remain, um, and asking why. Why is the word abide in there so many times? How is that, if that's the theme of this passage, what is he trying to tell us? And so what I want to do today is I just want to pick, I picked five things that I, I pulled out of the passage there about the encouragement that this, uh, this analogy is to us. If you look at the idea of abiding in Christ and look at the implications of what he's uh, shared with us, then we can talk about how impactful that is in our lives, but also the encouragement that it is for us as Christ followers. So I'll give you five of them. The first is this. We get to know the true vine. The very first statement is, I am the true vine. And what that, what that means to me is that there is no wandering in darkness. We don't have to guess. We don't have to wonder. We're not on a, a soul-searching life mission to find out where or what is truth. It's actually there in front of us. Jesus is telling us that he is the true vine. He also doesn't say that he's the only vine. And I think reality, the reality is there's many things that we could graft our lives into. There's many things that we could abide in um, that all lead to um, death or darkness or, or misguided aims in life. But we get to know that, that Jesus is the true vine. The second is we are actually a part of that vine. His statement actually says, abide in me, and I in you. That's far more than just understanding or knowing that he is the true vine. We're actually invited into relationship. We're grafted into the family of God. We actually get to be a part of the vine. And so our guidance and direction for life is, is right there again in front of us. We get to be able to watch and learn from the life of Jesus. We get the, the word of God to be able to guide our lives. Um, and we have Christ as our example because again, we get to be a part of that vine. The third encouragement I would say is, we get to bear fruit for the glory of God. The purpose of the branches in this analogy is to bear the fruit. You notice that he makes uh, a direct statement about their purpose. And so if he is the vine and we are the branches, us as branches actually get the privilege to be the ones who actually bear the fruit. Uh, I saw it defined, um, again, in a commentary as, uh, sorry, the, the bearing fruit, as God's work in us and through us. And I think, again, as far as the depth of learning within this analogy, it's amazing to say we get the privilege to be the bearers of the fruit, but it also doesn't say that we are the ones who, do, who actually do it. There's a very, very um, loud statement about our ability to do things on our own. Um, but it's the, actually our privilege. We get to be the ones who bear the fruit. We get to be the hands and feet. We get to be a part of this vine, and then we get to, um, we get the blessing that it is to bear fruit. I know that sometimes when you think about um, bearing fruit, the work part of it comes into play, and I think that's a, 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 a neat part of the analogy as well. Of it doesn't just come from nothing. It isn't just automatically there. There's a willingness, there's a, a pruning, there's a, a growth needed for there to actually bear good, good fruit. The fourth encouragement, um, and I'll explain, I've stated as a negative, so, so bear with me. The fourth encouragement is this. 
We cannot bear fruit by ourselves. Sounds super encouraging, right? It is not our ability, because that's God's work. The fruit does not come from our own effort. And I find that extremely encouraging because we're in way over our heads if we're trying to work with or we're trying to create or we're trying to facilitate heart change. We don't actually have that ability. Um, one of the favorite things I get to do, and um, it's why Jill and I have been in camp ministry for, for decades at this point, um, is telling the stories of what God does daily in the lives of campers, and you get to see, we get to, get to see it firsthand. So I'll share one um, just from this summer that reminds me that we don't bear fruit by ourselves. Um, I lament a little bit that my current job as executive director ends up being an office job on really nice summer days sometimes, and kids are out there playing and having a great time, and I'm sitting in an office um, with the very necessary things that are part of my job description. Um, so I do find time to, to get out there and, and be a part of, of the summer um, fun and festivities part of it. Um, but often when people come visit me in the office, it's not for the best reasons. Uh, I don't know if you've had those experiences, but, but when they call on me, it's often something's gone wrong or we need help with something or there's a camper issue or a medical emergency or who knows. It's generally not great. So I was in the office by myself um, and there's the door opened and in, in a hurry and I could tell there was somebody at the door. So I jumped out to see who it was and there is... Um, a female counselor or a cabin leader and her camper and the camper is crying. And so I start, you know, processing. What are things, how are things going? What's happening? How are you doing? Are you okay? And I get no response. And I was like, this is worse than I thought. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I can't even speak. So then I asked her again. I was like, is everything all right? And through the, the tears come this little grin and uh, I didn't, so now, now I'm a little concerned, either something really bad's happened or this is a real mischievous kid, I don't know. Um, and I look over at her cabin leader and her cabin leader has the same tears and grin. And that is where, uh, yeah, that's when I gained the, the full understanding of the, the situation because I've seen it so many times. And I get to, I've had to, I've been able to witness that myself and with my own campers when I was a young counselor, and, and it's just, yeah, it's such an amazing spot to be in. I get to ask her, so, do you want to tell me anything? And she says, uh, all she could get out was, I think the, the phrase was, I've been bored again. She just blurted it out in, in the, the office, and, and again, I don't get to be, you know, walking alongside those cabins, ca uh, campers like the cabin leaders do. Sometimes I get little snippets here and there, and for me, man, it was such a, a boost, such a blessing to be able to watch it again happen, knowing, you know, and hearing about the backstory of how many conversations were had and where, where this had come from. Um, long story short, this, this girl had given her life to Christ and was super excited about it. She wanted to call home, so they burst into the office. I got to call my parents and tell them what I've done. And so we got to hear this um, replay itself on the phone as she again struggled for words and then her mother was really concerned for her, realized that she had given her life to Christ and then was super excited for her on the phone. Um, I believe it was the same day, uh, later that day, her sister gave her life to Christ and we did the whole thing over again um, with the sister and we got to celebrate as a group, um, as, a, as a camp family of just these two young girls who had had given their life to Christ. And uh, the part that I, I remember distinctly, the image I see in my head is the following campfire. We're sitting around, we're singing songs. And uh, the cabin leader at that point just has two girls under her arms and they're just, they're just smiling and weeping and singing. And just the joy that comes from just the, the freedom in Christ that, that was experienced in that moment. And looking forward to, you know, just walking with him, and uh, yeah, it was just, again, just a reminder. It took me all the way back to when I was young, and, and that story, that, that experience that's been replayed over and over and over again, and 
we also get to um, watch what happens from there. The other girls in their cabin, I thought this is pretty awesome. The other girls in their cabin started asking, like, when do I get to go for a one-on-one? -on -one? Because if that's how you come back from a one-on-one, -on -one, that's what I want. I want to see, you know, I want to know what that is. When is it, when is it my turn? And uh, so we had a great week that week. And I also got the privilege to, to re or get the privilege to report that that fall, um, following camp, uh, those two girls, along with both of her parents, uh, were baptized in a local church. And we get to still see them, and we get to walk alongside them. And we have a church body that is just so excited for their family. They're so excited for camp because there's just this, this growth that has happened in the family. And so on that end, it was, again, a massive reminder that we can set out and we can program. We can create new camps. We can create new activities. We can do super fun stuff. And at the end of the day, we have exactly zero power to change any heart. We just get to be, we just get to abide in the vine. We just get to be the branches. And where God wants to work, he works. So long as we are diligent and we are faithful to step into those spots and walk alongside those kids, um, we, get to, we get that privilege to, to bear the fruit. And that's why I view it as a massive encouragement. We can't do this by ourselves because he does it and we, we just get to be those hands and feet. The last encouragement um, from that passage I'll leave you with is uh, that it actually says in, uh, in one of the verses there, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Perhaps you, like me, read this when you were a young person. Um, I don't know how you interpreted it, but I wished for a motorbike for a long time. And so I asked for that motorbike diligently through par prayer um, many years on end. Um, I've come to understand that's not exactly what he was talking about. Um, but it is a very direct, very strong statement to say, ask for whatever you wish in my name and, and it will be given to you. And again this summer, it, was, it dawned on me that, that that literally does happen. We asked God to move at camp last summer. We asked him to bring um, campers and staff that needed to be there, that he wanted to be there. We asked for him to soften their hearts and be able to be turned towards him. We asked for him to work mightily in, in the hearts of our campers. And there we were, watching it happen again. And it was, it was right in front of us. We know it's not from our, our own doing. But we were able to literally ask him for something that was um, in his name. And he just did that right in front of our eyes. And so it is a massive encouragement as well. Um, to know that, that that statement is true. Um, in conclusion, I just want to leave you with a few things that I thought were really interesting. I, I had read up a few different, I think I found this one in a devotional actually, about John 15. And it was practical applications of abiding. What does abiding really mean? How do you, how do you put that in place? Like, I'm going to go out from here today and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abide. That's a... It's a verb, but it, it needs some specifics to make a lot of sense or make more sense maybe in our daily life. And so what this devotional did is it tried to give you a few different tools to think about, are you abiding in Christ? What does that look like in your daily life? Um, so there's, there was four pieces. One is this. Take a personal inventory. Where did I abide today? What did I remain in? Did I abide in anxiety? Did I abide in anger? Did I abide in regret? Or did I abide in Christ and his love for me, who he says I am, and what he's asked me to do with the people around me? The second is, listen, just listen. In devos and in prayer, take time to just be silent. Try not to fill it with extra things. Just abide in the presence of God and what his word says. There's a staff member at, at camp that I love his, his take on this. He says, sometimes when I really need to abide or just rest in Christ, he says, I'll take a, a passage and I'll read it and I'll just think about it. I won't say anything. I won't expect anything. And as soon as my mind goes somewhere else, I read it again. And then I sit and I wait again. 
And he said, I do this until I can just actually think about what this passage says. The third is gratitude. Take time to give thanks. Thankfulness is a perspective changer. So take time to give thanks to God for all of the things that he gives us. And the fourth is stillness. Pause. Take a few moments away from distraction. Meditate on scripture. And allow God to speak. There's a lot of distractions these days. Um, Whether it be busyness or work or phones or, or what it may be. There's a lot of things that we can put in little moments of the day. We can add and add and we can fill it up. But if we want to abide in Christ, we need to take some time. We need to be still. Allow him to speak to us. So I want to encourage you to abide in Christ. It's not a light word. I saw it defined somewhere as complete dependence, constant connection. But abiding in Christ isn't so much just an activity that we plug ourselves into half an hour a day. Abiding in Christ is a a perspective. It's a heart position to what God would like for our day, what he would like from us. And I want to say just how encouraging it is to us. Super encouraging to be in uh, a place like this, um, just as other, I guess, branches in the vine where I get to see and talk and, and reminisce about camp things or um, just even just family and um, how God is working in this community. It's a privilege that we have to be able to abide in Christ. It's a privilege to be able to work for him. Um, And it's a privilege to come here and be able to share how we get to see God work, um, knowing and trusting how God works in their congregation. And I thank you guys because I, the the one thing that has changed for me in in a year is seeing familiar faces. Um, There's a lot of new faces last year, just going to different, yeah, groups and congregations, etc. And so I just want to say personally thank you for for who shows up to drop off kids, um, who shows up to to volunteer or pray or greet us at the door. And so thank you for walking alongside us in that ministry. Um, yeah, small things are, are massive encouragements. Um, I know when, when Chad and the girls came up this summer, just to help out, it's like I, I, sometimes in the middle of the, the heat of the moment, it's like, I don't even know exactly what I'll get you to do right now. And, and uh, I can say, Chad, we did finish the deck, by the way. Yeah. I know, I know there was probably some concern of like, are you ever going to get around to doing this? <laughs> um, but we did, yes. So yeah, a big thank you from us at Pemina Valley Bible Camp of how you are involved in so many different ways. And we thank you for the opportunity to come and share again about what God does at the camp. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you. Uh, thank you for the privilege that it is that we get to, um, we get to read from your word. We get to talk about you in this public place. We get to share our lives with one another and encourage one another. And we thank you that you continue to work, um, that you are, you are one who can create heart change. You can draw people to you. And we thank you that you ask us to be a part of that. Um, we thank you for your faithfulness in doing that and continuing to do that. And I pray, God, that you would just um, encourage us to abide in you, that our, our lives may be directed, our hearts may be positioned, to see and hear and to understand as we grow closer to you. Thank you again for this day, Lord. Amen.